Um, so our next speaker is Darren Martin. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so he's going to talk about, or he's going to take a look at um, one of the things you've been looking at the past time in TR64, I believe, right? And that's being used a lot in the UK and Ireland as well, or all, out, all over the world in customer preferences equipment. So he's doing some work on that, so he's going to talk about that. Um, I read on his Twitter account that he once got rickrolled by the NCC UK. So I'll leave it to you if you want to discuss that, or I'll leave it to you on the Q&A to see what was that all about. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is trying to rickroll us here, but please do if you, if you want. <laughs> so let's just hand it over to Darren and give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks. What? Yeah. Thank you. All right, so um, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, Tier 06 fail, another CP misconfiguration management disasters, which is a bit of a mouthful, but um, hopefully it'll make sense in a minute. So um, who am I? I'm a software arsonist at Xiphos. Um, I burn down full software stacks for fun. Um, I love playing with embedded software and embedded weird stuff. Um, before that, I was a forensic student, a pharmaceutical student, and an internet miscreant, so it's been a bit of a weird way of getting to here. Um, I also absolutely despise XML and everything to do with XML and its weird angle bracket of bullshit. Um, <laughs> which, you know, kind of sucked because every single bit of this research involved like dealing with tons of horrible, horrible XML stuff, which kind of, the hate kind of drove me and kind of helped me break more things. Um, and again, as when I was introduced, um, I once got rickrolled by the NCSC, which is like the British government's cyber something, something, something group, um, because apparently they've tried to develop a sense of humor. So um, what I'll be talking about is um, some wonderful protocols, Tier 064, um, which is full of holes, and Tier 069, which also has a bunch of related flaws. Um, hacking ISPs, ACS servers, so you can take over the world, and a bunch of other miscellaneous bits in between in no particular order, because I don't know how to order a slide deck in a logical format. So um, before we begin, there's some wonderful prior art. Um, at CCC and DEF CON, there was um, a couple of talks by Shahar Tal. Um, one was I hunt 069 admins, and the other was his work on the misfortune cookie bug. They're well worth like looking at those talks, because they contain a lot of the prior art that led to allowing me to do this work. Um, also, some links, some specifications for the 069 and 064 protocol and slide deck. You might want to download the protocols and go mad trying to make sense of them, because um, they're just a complete mess. But they're good to read through and try and make sense of it all. So firstly, a primer on what T or some numbers here means. Um, they're specifications put out by the DSL forum, which is like an industry working body of internet service providers um, who come together and they come up with these really stupid protocols to try make interoperability and try make compatibility so everything works together. Of course, none of it works because it's all shit that's designed by committee. Um, they try really hard. And the two I'm going to be talking about are the 064 and 069. There are a whole bunch of others. They're all disgusting in their own special and unique way. And I'm fairly sure they all involve XML somewhere. So um, 064 is land-side DSL CP configuration. So that's um, for configuring a CP from the land side of the network. Um, the specification outlines this wonderfully hideous SOAP-based protocol that allows you to set up your router. So back in the day, you'd get your broadband router off your service provider, and it'd come with an internet setup disk. And you'd connect up your router, you'd put the disk in, and the disk would use TR064 to talk to your router and configure it. So it would do all the setup stuff over this SOAP service, which is only supposed to listen on the LAN side. But we'll get to what happens there later. Um, 069 is the CWMP, CP WAN management protocol. It's for the other side of the network. It's so that your ISP can manage your router in your house remotely. It's effectively, not to beat around the bush, it's a back door. Um, so your ISP can snoop on your stuff, see what devices are on your network, reconfigure your stuff, and do tech support calls. Um, the spec outlines like this disgusting protocol for management of CP over WAN. It's also SOAP based. It's also got a bunch of Jabber stuff in it for no fucking reason. Um, and it's on Amendment 5. There'll probably be like an Amendment 6 soon because they can't make up their mind. They just keep adding more stuff to it. So um, 
We'll start with 064, the LAN side one. So it allows managing any setting on your home router. So on your home router, you've got a lot of settings like DNS servers, um, the ACS server configuration, wireless security settings, and all this. And the idea with 064 is if you're on the LAN side, like the trusted internal network side of a device, you should be able to manage it. So instead of just doing what normal people do and using like SNMP or something you know, normal, they invented their own shit protocol to do this. And it comes with a bunch of these wonderful security requirements because they actually thought about the word security. So it says stuff like um, any action that allows configuration changes to the CP must be password protected. Um, it also says access to any password protection action must require HTTP digest auth. And then it says stuff like sensitive information such as passwords must not be readable at all. And these are, you know, must and must not things. And you think the people implementing it would stick to these. And it's not explicitly stated in the spec, but this is only supposed to listen on the internal network, the LAN side of a device. It's not supposed to be exposed to the internet at all. So we know how this story goes. You know, someday, dreams. So um, what I found was password protected, God no. Nobody seems to bother implementing that. Um, Fritzbox have actually implemented password protection, but there's probably a default. Um, that stuff about not being able to read passwords in plain text, oh no, we can't be bothered sticking in dummy values or any of that nonsense. Of course, we're just going to let them be readable in clear text. No crypto there. Um, and of course, because it's a shitty embedded device, it's accessible over the internet. Because why not? You know, We might as well make it your router configurable by somebody half the way across the world. And also, one of the implementations that I was looking at came with a bonus trivial command injection bug just to, you know, make it even worse. So um, the obvious outcome and why this matters was some stuff happened, like some pretty serious stuff happened when the people started looking at this and when this got out. So um, any of you here from Germany might remember when Deutsche Telekom decided to cease functioning for a while. Um, the poor chap who did it was recently given a suspended sentence. He was recently in court. He was an English guy who got caught because somebody decided to worm the command injection bug and infect like a million routers, but their worm was a bit sucky, so it ended up just toasting the internet for loads of people. And it wasn't just Deutsche Telekom. TalkTalk Talk in the UK, um, any of you here familiar with the ISP TalkTalk? Talk? Well, if some other ISP is going to screw up really badly, TalkTalk Talk are like, hold my beer, I got this. And you know, they jump straight in and try fuck it up even worse. So TalkTalk Talk got completely wrecked. Um, Demon Internet, Post Office Internet, Aircom back in Ireland, now known as Air, they all got absolutely destroyed. Like customers had to like, you know, customers wire internet just ceased functioning. Um, they to in some cases apparently ship replacement devices, they to like ship out firmware updates, they to scramble to try fix it. And they also, like, people's wireless keys were being stolen remotely, and it was just complete bloody mayhem. And they were all just kind of going, oh, shit. We should have, you know, fixed this when we made aware about it ages ago, but they didn't, so whatever. Um, who was behind this? Um, where's our attribution party? Are we, you know, it was like, so who done it? Do we roll a dice and lands in Iran and we blame them today like Clown Strike do? No, it turned out it was script kiddies from the internet. And, okay, that's completely unreadable, but basically, in the new NTP server variable that you can send to the device. You just stick in some back ticks and whatever shell commands you want to run, the router would just run them as root. So what these guys were doing was spaffing these all over the internet, W getting down a piece of malware, then continue to run. And they'd written quite an efficient little worm you know, for a bunch of script kiddies. Um, and all they want to do is packet the crap out of things. And here's the mandatory IDA screenshot of their malware with the spready bit, because you can't talk about Anthem malware related without having an IDA screenshot. It's how people know you know what you're doing. Um, so yeah, they, this lovely little binary that spread itself all over the internet and fucked up the internet for loads of people. Also, they could DDoS kiddies and Xbox Live or whatever it is the script kiddies do. So um, it wasn't the first time that this piece of software in particular had some issues. Before the t six fail bug, which completely toasted like internet for loads of people, we'd misfortune cookie, which was disclosed at 31C3 by Shahar, and that affected the same ROM page, page of server. Um, it, however, it affected the t 69 component, and it was this wonderful bug. It was effectively what I'd consider the simplest form of write what where, because 
you'll see in a minute, it was you could overwrite configuration variables on the device remotely by memory address value, key value in the cookies. So this is one of the proof of concepts from a guy called Kenzo for a specific Aircom router. And basically, the string, the C blah 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 numbers there is where you want to write to. And what it's equal to is what you're writing to that location. So it's a really trivial bug to exploit. And if you screwed it up, the router would just reboot and you could try again. So that particular payload for that particular router disables the authentication for the web administration panel. And it also disables the firewall so you can remotely then reconfigure the router as you see fit. And just send one request, boom, router suddenly opens up, open Sesame, which I thought was quite magic and quite a wonderful fuck up. So um, now that we've kind of gone on to 069, um, 069 is another DSL forum spec. It's got a bit about security in it. Um, it supports TLS, it supports authentication. Um, the protocol is complete garbage. It was designed by committee where everyone had their one bit that they wanted to put into it, and none of them quite agree, so they put all the shit together. So it's like, it's like the XML fan club decided to design something. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't know if there's any XML fans here, but you'd love this. Oh, we've got one right there. The one XML fan. So um, in 069, the SSL and TLS are optional. You've got some setups that are just clear text. Um, you've got some with like wonderful mutual auth and client side certs and cert pinning, um, which is all pretty cool. And you know, it, it really varies. It depends on how it was set up. Um, the authentication is also optional. CP to ACS will tend to use basic auth, but it doesn't actually use it for auth. Quite often, the password is shared across all users, and the usernames use an identifier for the device. If the ACS is talking to the CPE, you've often got like TLS with a client side cert, or it'll just use a shared secret that you can extract by reverse engineering the firmware of a router. And it's probably something shit like broadband one, in the case of one ISP that's quite large. Um, so yeah, 069 is like XML. So it's got some stun, it's got some soap. For some reason, it's got Jabber in there. I've no idea why there's XMPP. I think they just said, oh, this is also XML. We better add it, you know, keep all the XML heads happy. <laughs> it's like, um, it's an implementation of just, let's build the biggest attack surface we possibly can, and then put it on the internet to manage millions and millions and millions of devices. This stuff probably runs in your home. You know, this, this, there's an XML parsing gubbins on your wireless router that's doing something with this shit, probably. So, um, I mean, we can take for granted that the CPE end is internet of trash, it's cheapest manufactured little plastic blinking box of blinking lights that your, you know, your ISP buys in bulk and ships out to you that probably is rubbish security. But surely, the internet service provider themselves, they take their internal security seriously, we hope, and you know, surely they're securing their servers super well, and they're really good at this, and they have professionals. Surely, like the ISP end of this magical contraption of crap is like rock solid enterprise software. You know, it's a support license, probably written by Oracle or something. You know, really good. Um, and surely it can't be that bad. I mean, you have a committee of XML heads who designed this stuff. I mean, surely it can't be that fucking awful. Well, you're about to find out how bad it is, and it's pretty grim. So. Um, I thought to myself, take the threat model of a 12-year-old, right? You've got a 12-year-old who wants to take over the world. And I thought, hmm, OK, we've got a 12-year-old who wants to do world domination. So they want to hack a load of routers. They want to hack like millions of routers. They want to build the biggest internet of shit botnet ever so they can pack at people or do whatever it is script kiddies do when they pwn your router, because this is the thing they do these days. And I was like, OK, so we've got a lazy 12-year-old or 15-year-old or whatever, you know, teenage script kitty who's like wanting to take over the world. That's the threat model we're working with here. But we, w we want a really lazy one who doesn't want to actually go like hack routers one at a time or do any scanning or any of that, because that's like hard and effort. So once, you know, our threat actor here wants to hack all the routers at once in one go, in one shot, with no effort. So I said, OK, this is probably possible. This protocol is, you know, enough, enough horribleness in it, and there's enough crap software using it, that this should be pretty easy. So yeah, I decided to start auditing ACS servers. Um, so instead, of, again, like instead of hacking millions of devices, one at a time, even with scripts and bulk scanning and stuff, instead you just hack the one thing that has accessed all of them. It seems like the logical, you know, single point of failure. 
So I've been auditing these things in my free time. I've been looking at all the open source ones and found they're all fucking horrible. They're like disgusting messes. Um, so I'm going to talk now about some of the findings, some of the vulnerabilities we found, um, none of which have been patched yet. So um, audit so far, free ACS, which is disgusting. Um, I actually feel sorry for the developer. I think free ACS is like one person, and they're trying really hard to maintain this piece of software. But it's just, no, they should just stop. You know, it's, it's, it's beyond repair. You know, it's grown too complex. It's beyond repair. They should just stop and find something else to do. Open ACS is a complete piece of shit that barely works. It's abandoned. Um, you know, the person who wrote it clearly put a lot of effort in it once and then just realized they were going down the path of madness and stopped. Libre ACS is a fork of Open ACS. It's also abandoned. It's the same shit. It's the same bugs. I found um, a PHP CWMP library, like a PHP ACS that people are using in production, and it's written in PHP, so it's going to have problems. And there was also Perl CWMP, because apparently XML people love Perl, or, you know, Perl people love XML or whichever. So um, I decided to look at that as well, and we found some pretty fun stuff. So the disclosure timeline for free ACS was um, found bugs, um, weaponized the bugs, made some really reliable exploit. Um, dumped them on the internet, now still unfixed. So it's August now. They were public knowledge when I dumped them on GitHub in April for free ACS specifically, and nobody really cared. I haven't seen any like ISPs melt down yet, um, so whatever. And you're going to see just how really, really trivial these bugs are. So um, free ACS, it's, it's, um, it's quite old. It's been around for a while. Again, one person or group. It's uses Tomcat, which is Java horrendousness because XML and Java get along, and it uses MySQL. So I was like, oh, no, I'm going to have to read Java. I don't like doing that. Don't got time for that. So it advertises itself as the most complete TR069 ACS available for free under the MIT license, which is a pretty, pretty specific claim because I don't think there are any other ACS servers under the MIT license. So we can't, compest, we can't contest that claim at all. Um, However, I also read most complete means most attack surface, right? If you implement all this bullshit, you're going to screw up somewhere. And if any of you want some fun or want to go mad reading somebody else's Java, you should audit this software as well, because I've barely scratched the like, skin of the attack surface, and it's both huge and massive and attack surfacey. So you're going to find something within about 10 minutes. So um, why did I really pick? to hammer on free ACS, and this is the install instructions. It's like wget this like dodgy shell script over HTTP and then run it as root and then complete the remaining bit of the installation. So their shitty shell script that you download in plain text and just run as root doesn't even finish the install. It just does half of it, like 90%, but you end up spending ages editing configs because their installer sucks. So I was like, well, we're off to a pretty good start. So um, the default logins that you can, there are actually ones with these login creds on the internet. You can find them in Shodan, are admin xaps. Nobody seems to change it because the change password dialogue's a few menus deep. So um, you will find them. A Shodan query is entitled free ACS. Google entitled free ACS web web. You can try census.io, Bing. You could use some of the wonderful camp bandwidth scanning for these yourself um, or whatever. So. Um, Post authentication, this ACS server is like a cross site scripting test bed with optional device management features. Pretty much every parameter you can put user input to turns into a cross site scripting bug. So it's a really good way to test your XSS scanner. Um, all that's post auth, though, so like we'd have to log in first, and maybe they have changed the password. But here's some screenshots of alert boxes anyway. So the first one I found, and then another one. And then I had to start numbering my alert boxes, because I was losing track of which alert box I put in was coming out the other side. Um, so yeah, it's pretty grim. So, um, but I was thinking, post-auth XSS isn't all that big of a deal. What I want is a bug that's pre-auth, so no authentication to the device required, no authentication I can just you know, pwn it remotely with no idea what the creds are. I want it to be remote. So I didn't want any local bugs. I want a remote exploit that was super reliable. I want to give me at least, you know, privileged access, like an admin role in the ACS, so complete compromise. And I wanted to do it easy because my threat model is like a 12 to 15-year-old script kitty. So I was looking for something that wouldn't take too much effort. So um, the pre-auth attack surface is pretty enormous. And I was thinking about this for a bit, and I was thinking, 
What interacts with the ACS server without auth? And it's, well, I guess it's a CPE device in somebody's house. You know, that has to chat to the ACS. So I set about writing a T069 client. So I started off by creating a valid CWMP notify message, which this is an example from a, yeah, barely readable, but um, basically it posts a bunch of XML garbage. And I thought to myself, oh shit. I have, to write, I have to write a fuzzer that generates valid XML and does stuff, but there's loads of key value shit there. So I thought, okay. So I tried fuzzing the XML. Um, so I found there was a couple of DOS bugs that like killed the ACS server um, because the XML parser in it sucks. So I was able to get it to shut down a bunch of times, like stop working, hang, and kill my VM. Um, but I got bored of this really fast. So I thought, is there something else you know, that I can get along with that um, might give me more interesting results than just denial of service bugs? So I was thinking, there's the XML. I don't really want to play that game anymore. I'm bored of XML. What about the you know, CPE to ACS auth, the basic auth header? And I was like, basic auth spec is pretty loose. You can put whatever the hell you want in there. So it seemed like a pretty viable fuzz target for like testing various things. And oh yes. So it turns out that this particular ACS server used the basic auth username as a device ID, and it's used a unique-ish identifier in the database. So its input gets put into some st So this piece of input gets put through like a database and a bunch of queries, shows up in the UI. You know, there's loads of potential attack surface just in that code path. So I had a look. So yeah, the too long, don't read. The basic auth username gets put into a SQL query. It doesn't get sanitized. And then SQL queries gets ran. So you end up with this super easy to exploit-ish second order SQL injection bug. However, there is like a character length limit. So I couldn't get any useful SQL in there because I suck at like manually crafting SQL queries and just thought, oh, the hell with this. I'll find another bug. However, if you just send a single quote as your basic auth username, the ACS server will cease functioning forever. It'll just stop. Because every time it tries to do anything, it will trigger the SQL injection again, screw itself over, and just crash. So you can perma-dos it with one single quote. So um, I thought to myself, hmm, this, this is a good path. So um, username's unsanitized. Username pops up in the UI a lot. And there's clearly no sanitizing going on. And we already know it's full of XSS. So I thought, what if we could get an XSS injected in there that pops out like in the admin session so we can like jack the admin session. And um, yeah, it worked. So we found this remote persistent XSS in the basic auth header. And we unauthenticate it, send a CWMP notify, and the cross-site scripting pops out on the admin side and exploits the admin, so we just jack their session. There's a few payload limitations, but it's really easy to do. So um, that was my first test case of, yay, it works. And then I thought, I'll get it to load a remote script in to get around the character length limit, and it worked. So then I thought, right, I have to now write like a bit of JavaScript that'll take over the ACS server entirely for me. So I was looking, and I was like, oh, I'll just make it add a new user. So adding a new admin user is just a post request, and there's no CSERF protections or XSS protection or any of that nice web app sec stuff that we've had for years going on there. So, I thought, I'll go to Stack Overflow, I'll copy and paste some JavaScript to send a post request, and I'll stick that in my payload. And will it work? Can we build it? And um, yeah, so hacked together this disgusting proof of concept that sends a notify message, gets an informed response back, spins up a web server with the JavaScript payload on it, and then it gets injected into the admin session, and boom, you get a new user at it, and it notifies you at the end. So um, yeah, it. You send this, and then when the admin logs in, they'll get cross-site scripted, which happens in a, silently in the background. The alert box like for debugging and to show that something happens. Um, yeah, it adds a user. And the user shows up with admin is true. So you've just taken over the entire thing. So you have a remote, unauthenticated admin takeover bug, which is trivial to exploit, no effort. So what do you do next? Well, you can scan the internet, show it on census Google, whatever. You just spam out your payloads at all of these ACS servers. And within like a day or so, you'll have hacked them all. Um, it's super easy. Um, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. And then you have admin access to millions of routers, 
with like just a handful of post requests. So it's game over for all those ISPs and their customers. So hack the planet. So then I thought it, I'd look at OpenACS and LibreACS, um, which were the next audit targets. It took me ages to get them to work because they're shit and the documentation sucks. So I set them up as per the documentation. Then I realized, you know, you know, they barely work. There's not much to go on with broken software. So I stopped for a bit and I started reading through the setup docs again. And I found that the configuration for the JBoss server leaves it vulnerable to known exploits in JBoss, known code execution flaws. So I was like, oh. You don't even need a bug in the software when the way the software uses JBoss exposes it to this issue. So um, yeah, there's like three different ways to like own them. You can hit the JMX console, the web console, or the JMX invoker servlet. And also the install, met the install instructions leave the MySQL root password blank because that's a super clever idea because who needs alt anyway? So um, these things are just there and you can just pwn them. So that's um, open and libre misconfiguration server. Go have fun with those. So um, yeah, it's just a screenshot of owning one of them in my test network. I found a couple of these in the wild um, at a few smaller ISPs, and I was like, oh, whoa now. So I dropped them a couple of emails, didn't get any replies. Since then, one of the, one of the vulnerable ones that I found was decommissioned, but they ne just never got back to me. Um, I kind of stopped looking after that, so I was fairly sure that if I actually owned a bunch of ISPs, I'd get in a world of hurt. You know, apparently it's against the law or something, so decided not to do it. Um, I think some of the super vulnerable ones have been decommed, but there's still a few out there in use in the wild that people can have a play with. Um, if you ever want to like have the full experience of managing an ISP, just go own one and like realize why the tech support sucks so bad, because they're working with shitty software. So um, I needed a break from Java. You know, I was done with Java for a while, so I thought to myself, I'll chill out and look at something else. Um, so. I eventually came across this ACS written in PHP, and it's like a library, so you can DIY an ACS in it, and um, it's a good effort, you know? It's a, you know, you can build your own ACS server using it, and it uses Laravel and PHP and all that lovely web shit. So um, I started to just have a quick grep through it to see if there was something glaringly obvious. So I um, came up with this. Um, this pretty much explains my findings. Let's unserialize all the user input um, because that's a super clever thing to do. And here we go, we've got not one, but two unserialized on like cookie data. So you can just jam whatever the hell you want in there. And it turns out that Laravel does a bunch of auto loading. So you have like infinite pop gadgets to choose from. It like makes writing an unserialized exploit too easy for these. So it's like super simple. So you're able to like just send cookies with the data value as a serialized blob and then just suddenly boom instant code execution. So I was like, take it away. No, no, please nobody be running this in production. Unfortunately, some people actually are at pretty big ISPs. So um, this is out there, this exists. People actually do this, which surprised me. I was like, people actually still unserialize like random shit people send them. I thought people would have learned by now, but whatever. Um, it is exploitable because um, You've got Laravel, Composer, and all this other PHP nonsense, which gives you a massive choice of pop chains. Um, otherwise, you get yourself a nice memory corruption in PHP's and serialize, and just pwn it the same way those guys pwned Pornhub that time for the bug bounty, which was really neat. Um, basically, if you're using the PHP CWMP library, you're going to get wrecked. There's no question about it. You're just going to get toasted. And the final one I've looked at is um, called Perl CWMP. It's written in Perl. So I started fuzzing it manually with uh, the notify messages. And I came across this interesting bug within about 10 minutes of just crafting ones and sending it. So it was directory traversal allowing arbitrary file cre creation with partially controlled contents and partially controlled file name. And it would also create a directory with a controlled name. So I was like, I can put stuff with content on disk, but I don't fully control the content or the names. So, you know, it was interesting. So there's some ways in which this can be exploited, but it's unreliable. You can combine it with other bugs and other applications and the thing to get root, but it's a bit of a chore. You just, you change the serial number parameter to dot dot slash dot dot slash dot slash temp test, and it will create a folder, temp test, and it'll create a file, temp test.yaml. So it's super easy to do, and you can just like spaff files all over the box and, you know, do whatever. Um, 
We can also control values that get shot out into the file. The manufacturer, product class, and OUI all get put into the YAML file. And we can sneak executable code in there. Um, we can sneak in PHP and put it in the web root. And maybe it might execute. Maybe it might not. Um, it's fairly trivial exploit under the right circumstances. Um, and we have another exploit because fuck Perl, apparently. Um, I got one of my friends who like is a Perl master to come have a look. Um, Senor Entz, who's around somewhere. He speaks Perl. He speaks the weird regex language of brackets. Um, and turns out the manual says to run Perl CWMP in debug mode, which actually opens an enormous remote code execution hole because Perl does really weird stuff. Um, so you send like one request to it um, with, the, with some bits, and it just gives you command execution. It's super reliable and it's repeatable. So I was like, oh, how? oh wow. So um, my friend then, he was helping out, and he goes, actually, because Perl, and because he likes to do Perl golf, he fit the exploit in a tweet. <laughs> so um, if you, like, put that tweet into a .pl file and provide it with an IP, a port, and a command to run on any server running Perl CWMP, it will run that command on the server and give you the output. So apparently, you know, we can tweet the proof of concept these days. You could probably shave more bytes off and make a smaller one if you enjoy Perl Golf. Um, yeah, I thought it was, it's a pretty neat bug. So I'll try, yeah, so basically, you stick, oh god, I can't even read Perl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, backticks and Perl variable magic voodoo. Um, if any you speak Perl, you'll be able to make sense of it. Um, yeah, and it just sends it, and magic happens. As far as I'm concerned, witchcraft, because Perl. Um, so yeah, that's the fun, that was, um, I owe him a couple of beers to this, because I put out a bounty on like, find, you know, exploiting a different bug in it, and he just comes up with this tweetable exploit. So, um, wherever he is. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, the final bit is, what can we actually do if we hack an ACS server, which we clearly can? Um, we can reconfigure settings on every user of an ISP. We can go around, reconfigure all their routers. We could change everyone's DNS servers to our DNS servers and conduct mass farming attacks. We could like redirect paypal.com to our paypal.com, whatever, and do mass phishing. Or we can push out malicious firmware upgrades really easily to all the clients. Can you imagine the cleanup costs of like 10 million routers with firmware rootkits that have been disconnected from the legit ACS? The ISP would have to ship new units out, there'd be engineers' visits, it'd cost millions to clean up, I think. We can also screw with billing, we can provision new devices, etc. You know, we can do an awful lot. Or we can just jack everyone's wireless keys in a free internet forever. Um, it's, you can just, whatever you can imagine is possible. Um, there's also a friend of mine and I came up with this idea. You could, um, the ACS server stores firmware images for the routers that it manages because it pushes updates. So you'd download all the images, you'd patch all the firmwares, so you'd, you know, you'd write patches for as many as possible, to, so, and you could write a simple bit of code that would tell the ACS to rep phone home to the real ISP's one, but actually only take commands from your one. So it had hide from the ISP that their entire estate has just been taken from underneath them. You could then persistently crap these out onto all the routers, clear the logs from the ACS server, question mark, question mark, question mark, profit. You're now an ISP, you manage millions of devices, you're probably going to go mad, unfortunately, as a side effect. You've just gotten a second job. Um, that's one technique you could do. You can use your imagination. There's so many potential ways to do horrible things using this stuff. Um, so final bit, the defenses ISPs use to protect these servers, um, sometimes they restrict the access to the ACS server to only the IP ranges of their customers, which is completely useless because all you have to do is hack one of their customers. And it's not as if that's impossible, right? Or they put them on a management subnet that only the CPE can talk to. That's also trivial to get around. You just hack one of the CPE devices, and then you can talk to that management subnet. That's what quite a few in the UK have started doing. Or you use client-side certs and mutual auth stuff. Again, we just pwn one CPE or get one and reverse engineer it, and then we've got the credentials. However, if you combine all these layers of defense together, you can make it somewhat of a pain in the ass to talk to the ACS server illegitimately. 
So I think we need to do a lot more work to help, you know, there, there is more work needed from the ISP side on actually defending their, like, main machine that does all the fancy, you know, that does all the management, because that shit's the crown jewels. And they have no protections on them at the moment that are worth anything. So um, what's next in the agenda for this, because I'm no, you know, I'm, what's next on the research agenda for this is auditing more ACS servers. And I, as I search more, I find more people have done small bits of work here and there on this. So it's like Genie ACS, which is, which is pretty amazing because it involves like MongoDB and Redis and Node and Ruby on Rails and all this other hipster stuff that, you know, it's all this modern web stuff. So it's, it's also extremely well maintained. So I want to have a look at that. There's free ACSNG, which looks pretty tight, and it, but it's written in C, so there might be some interesting memory corruption to be found there. There's some Draytech and Cisco ones that are closed source. Um, there's some Dutch people who found a load of bugs in the Draytech stuff that I just stumbled across the other day. They had like a bunch of remote routes for it. So I need to have another look at the Draytechs. And the Cisco, Cisco of an ACS server, they've end of life recently, so I'm hoping to get one of those to reverse. I um, also need to look at more um, device implementations because the ACS client on the routers has like a web port that it listens on. And there's other servers besides just ROM pager, like the ISP Orange in France recently enough, I think was recent, they open sourced their ACS client. So that's available on their GitHub, so I want to have a look at that. Um, and I also want to look at tier 111, which is tier 069 for your internet of trash. So um, this is how your ISP, some ISPs also do televisions and stuff. They want to be able to manage your smart TV. So tier 111 is for like stuff on the internal network that your ISP manages for you, like your set-top box or something is what their intended use for this is, and smart TVs. Um, with a lot of ISPs also being television providers, you know, as in they provide TV channels and stuff, I think this can become more prevalent in the future because they've already got the protocol, they've got the tools, they just need to deploy it and roll it out. We're seeing a few instances of it, so that's kind of my next bit of work to look at. Um, and yeah, finally, I guess, thanks. Um, thanks to you all for listening. Um, yeah. Thanks. Is this on? Yeah, it is. Thanks, Darren, for the talk. Um, maybe some of you still have questions. Please go up to the microphones. There's one in the back and one in the front. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you disclosed this, like full disclosure, you just put it on the internet. Did you consider doing coordinated vulnerability disclosure? No, um, I've had bad experiences with responsible disclosure. Um, coordinated disclosure tends to lead to vendors being a pain in the ass, and I've just gotten tired of dealing with vendors and you know holding their hand through the disclosure process. So I now just dump it on the internet unless they have a bug bounty. You know, it's unless you're going to give me some money for wasting my time dealing with the vendor, then I'm just going to dump it on the internet or keep it private. You know. Okay.